extraordinary biomass burning episode and impact winter triggered by the Younger Dryas cosmic event approximately 12,800 years ago. So you see how the, the, the dating has been a little bit adjusted. I think this is primarily because they've, they're using the platinum deposition layer as the datum. Anyways, this was published in, uh, this is part one, Ice Cores and Glaciers. Published in the Journal of Geology, 2018. They begin the paper by saying that Firestone at Al po initially posited that exotic materials found in the Younger Dryas boundary layer provide ep evidence of a major cosmic impact event caused by Earth's collision with a cometary swarm. See, I like that. They're, they're, they're gravitating towards that idea, which is really quite a bit different than the idea of just a single mass impact or a single isolated one event, one on, boom, right? Which is basically the models that the critics were attacking. Not the idea of a cometary swarm. Very distinct processes, right? I think if we're looking at a cometary swarm, yeah, you can go attack all the, the single impactor event all you want, that scenario all you want, but you're not really addressing the scenario that's, that's emerging from the evidence. Okay. Uh, studies of more than 40 sedimentary sequences distributed across North, and this is addressing the question you just asked, Studies of greater than 40 sedimentary sequences distributed across North and South America, Western Europe, and Western Asia document peaks in exotic Younger Dryas boundary materials, including iron-rich spherules, silica-rich glassy spherules, melt glass, nanodiamonds, iridium, platinum, and osmium. Independent groups have confirmed much of the Younger Dryas Boundary impact evidence, but others have not or have offered alternate explanations. And we have looked at some of that. I felt it was important to at least give a cursory uh, recognition of the critics. And I actually would like to get back because I believe that the critics raised some valid points. And it is important when you are looking at any scientific controversy that you look at all sides. Now, when I started looking at the back and forth between uh, the proponents of an impact hypothesis and the critics of the impact hypothesis, my um, alignment came down on the side of the proponents, obviously, because most glaringly, the opponents of the impact hypothesis provide no coherent hypothesis for what happened? You see what I'm saying? They, in other words, the extinction of the megafauna, and, and, and some of them do not accept the overkill hypothesis. So right there, that's saying that the loss of the Clovis culture, the extinction of the megafauna are two different unrelated events, basically, right? Then you throw in the climate change, unrelated event. They just happen to co coincide in time but they didn't really have anything, you know, the climate change, what, didn't have anything to do with the extinction? Well, yes, it did, but really, how? Then the, the, the question is ignored. You know, when we look at those graphs and we see these giant spikes, to me, it's like, well, wait a second. You can't just talk about a climate change like that and ignore what's driving or causing that climate change, right? I mean, yeah. if if suddenly the temperature of, our, the planet now plunged by eight degrees centigrade in the next five years, wouldn't the prudent question be, well, what's causing that? Or we just, oh, it's just part of the natural order. We won't even address it. We won't even think about it. It just happens. No, I don't think that if you're going to be scientific that things just happen, there are reasons, there are causes, right? Something is driving that climate change. We have the climate change, we have the Clovis culture, we have the megafaunal extinctions, we have the massive meltdowns that have to be correlated, in my mind, with climate change. Yet, 
I never see the proponents of the mega floods go beyond, oh, you had this ice dam and this big lake and the ice dam broke through the broke away, the lake drained out. But how does that relate to the to the uh, to the uh, climate change? How does that relate to the melting of the whole southern sector of the Cordillera and ice sheet? It seems like maybe some of them are starting to look at that by admitting, well, oh, maybe there was a, a lake higher up northern, uh, further north in, in British Columbia that contributed to the flooding. But you still don't see, okay, my criticism has always been this. Okay, here's this huge lake, more than 600 cubic miles of water, held in by glacial ice, 2,000 feet deep or more, which I consider to be an impossibility. And that was the source of the floods. But no... No addressing or asking the question, well, where the hell did that gigantic mass of water filling these entire mountain valleys of western Montana come from? Where did that come from? You're not, you're not answering the question of the ultimate origin of these mega floods by saying it came from Lake Missoula. Because you've got a huge mass of water there that had to get there somehow. Now, was it was it precipitation? I mean, so you're saying that there was enough rainfall or snowfall that it fills the whole freaking watershed up to almost the highest level where the only thing feeding into it is first order streams. Now, you know, first order stream is the littlest stream. If you look at the, 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 the stream and river order of, say, the North American continent, Mississippi River is 12th order. You know what that means? That means that, that if you start from the smallest streams that could be measured that might that have generally quasi-permanent flow, not the ones that are only being fed when it rains, but where you have maybe a spring, it's feeding a stream. Okay, it, it feeds into another stream. So you got first order stream, second order stream. That second order stream feeds into a third order stream. Somewhere between four, five, six orders, it's going to feed into a river. That's going to be a tributary to a bigger river. Okay, that's how you get stream orders. Generally, when you have a lake forming, in a catchment basin, it's being fed by all the rivers and streams into it, right? When you look at Lake Missoula, you're basically looking at 600 plus cubic miles of water that at its final stages of, of accumulation is only being fed by the tiniest little streams in the whole system of, of stream order. And I'm sorry, that makes no sense. So you got to say, wow, that's where cool. did this body of water come from? So. Was it rainfall? Repeatedly. repeatedly, repeatedly, yes. So was it rainfall or snowfall? Well, then you got to go, well, how much rain? Now you have to look at the physics of the thing because as, you're, as, as the land, water is deepening, it's expanding in its air, area. That's going to increase the rate of evaporation, right? So you can. there are calculations. You can do those. I won't get into that now. But yeah, basically, if the inflow is steady, it slows the accumulation. It, it slows yes, the, yes. the rise. Yeah. yeah. I mean, take, for example, looking at the Great Lakes, I find are good analogs, or some of the big, bigger lakes, Great Bear Lake, or, or some of the bigger lakes in Canada, or even, you know, Flathead Lake in Western Montana, or Lake Pend Oreille in, in a lot of these lakes. You can basically see that there's this equilibrium between evaporation and, and precipitation, right? Now, sometimes you'll get uh, excessive precipitation, the lake may rise, you'll get maybe a drought period, the lake level drops, but it stays within a certain range. And, and it, it's only going to rise up to a certain point at which the evaporation is going to equal the precipitation and it's not going to accumulate any more water. Then you look at the basin of glacial Lake Missoula and that whole thing is filled 600 plus cubic miles of water up to the first order streams. Well, that means it had to just been raining and raining and raining and raining, in my opinion, to, to get that. And, and now at the same time, you've got an environment that could support that much precipitation, but you've got right there, contiguous with that, you have to assume that there's this huge, stable glacial lobe completely sealed off with the substrate, holding back a wall, a hydraulic head with over 960 PSI at the base, at the, at the heel of that ice dam. How plausible is that? Well, we're going to address that in detail, that question, because I have noticed I've gotten a lot of criticism from people who have really no clue what my interpretation of these flood events is, because somehow they've got the notion and they're saying, well, Randall's 
Randall's theory of a, of a single mega flood isn't supported by the evidence. Look, when you say something like that, you're simply saying you have no idea at all what I'm actually talking about. Okay. So the other point is, is that if that lake is being fed by meltwater, well, that means to produce that copious amount of meltwater, the glacial ice has to be receding. It's going to be melting back, right? But then you've got to have this perfectly stable, long ice lobe completely filling the valley of Pend Oreille down to Spokane, right? We're going to get into that. We're going to look at that in detail. And I think that once you begin to look at the, the, the glacial ice dam theory, it just doesn't hold water. 